Hello, everyone. This is Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, December 2nd, 2024. This is time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Liz. I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to the adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython Mises Discord role. There is a shared notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The file notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest note stock so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. First part is community news. Second part is state of CircuitPython libraries and Bolinka. Third part is hug reports. Fourth part is status updates. And the fifth part is in the weeds. And that covers how the meeting would go. And with that, we can kick things off with community news. So first up, MicroPython v1.24.1 is out. MicroPython v1.24.1 is a patch release containing 21 new commits to the code base. It is particularly useful for RP2 and ESP32 builds, and it's also a good idea to update MP Remote. And there's GitHub release notes and pre-built downloads. And then also pertaining to MicroPython, the best bits, Matt Trentini at PyCon Australia 2024. MicroPython continues to grow in popularity. But why? What is it about this pipe-sized version of Python that makes it compelling? What are the best parts of MicroPython? Join Matt Trentini in this talk for a whirlwind tour of some of the most exciting features of this modern embedded programming language. And the talk is available on YouTube and Slides, and it was sent in via Mastodon. And then Project of the Week, CircuitPython PIO I2S Library by Cooper Dalrymple provides bi-directional I2S audio communication using PIO on Raspberry Pi RP2 microcontrollers, and that's on GitHub and Adafruit Playground if you want to check that out. So these news items and more are available in our weekly micro Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out via email on Monday mornings. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open PR on GitHub in the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter repository. Tag Anne Engineer hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon or X or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. And that is community news. Next up is State of CircuitPython, Libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. So first up, overall, there were 16 pull requests merged by nine authors. Those authors were ADCC, Jepler, Sean the IT Guy, Brandon Hurst, Anecdata, Bablo KB, Aguaviva, Foamy Guy, and D. Halpert. There were seven reviewers, Jepler, Lady Ada, Brent Rue, Foamy Guy, The Kitty, D. Halpert, and Tanute. There were 19 closed issues by seven people, 15 new issues opened by 14 people. And now we're going to hear from Scott about the core. Hello, thank you, Liz. Okay, let me scroll up. So numbers for the core, we had 11 pull requests merged from eight different eight different authors. Uh, shout out to Brandon Hurst in particular, who uh, works for Analog Devices and committed a new port this week for 
uh, one of the new analog devices chips. Uh, so shout out to them in particular. Uh, we have four reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. We have 23 open pull requests, so we're uh, a couple under our one-page goal, which is 25 pull requests. Uh, Issues-wise, we had eight closed issues by four people, seven open by seven people, so we're net down one for 759 open issues. Uh, we have seven active milestones. Uh, the main ones of interest are there's two open issues on 92X. These are issues on our current stable release that we probably want to get uh, a look at. Uh, 47 issues for 9XX, things that we should do sooner rather than later. And then um, 12 open issues on 10.0, which we're still figuring out what 10.0 is. And uh, Dan mentions in the notes that there are no issues assigned, not assigned to milestones, so they've all been triaged. Uh, so we're keeping up with that. Great, thank you. And now we'll hear from Foamy Guys about the libraries. All right, thanks, Liz. This section covers all of the CircuitPython uh, libraries. Um, these can all be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is uh, for the Adafruit libraries. And then uh, some of the stats here also represent libraries from the community bundle, which are uh, created and shared by members of the community and not Adafruit directly. Um, we have uh, 347 libraries currently in the Adafruit bundle and 159 in the community bundle for a total of 506 libraries right now. Um, across the Adafruit libraries this week, we had five pull requests merged by two authors, uh, thanks to Jeff and myself. We had six reviewers, thanks uh, also to Jeff, Lady Ada, myself, uh, Anne, Brent, and uh, Dan H. this week for uh, reviews and libraries. Um, of the pull requests that were merged, they were all uh, on the newer side, one and two days old. Uh, that leaves us at the end of the week with 49 open pull requests across the libraries. The oldest one is 837 days. The newest one is one day. Um, we had 10 issues closed by three people and eight new issues opened up by seven people. Uh, so we're net down a little bit. And that leaves us at the end of the week with 831 open issues. Uh, and there are 98 of them that uh, I'll say were labeled as good first issue. I did go through and close a number of the display.io uh, example issues. So there will be um, a good chunk of the these will be gone next week for the numbers. But I just did that this morning, so they're not represented in this week's stats. Um, if you would like to get involved with CircuitPython, uh, you can find a list of uh, things to work on over at circuitpython.org slash contributing. Uh, if you are new to the process, the place where we tend to point folks towards first is on that page, circuitpython.org slash contributing. Uh, when you first open it up, you will see a list of open PRs across all the different libraries. Uh, and that tends to be the, the thing we point people towards uh, first. So if you take a look through the list of PRs and find something that's interesting to you or that you've got the hardware for, you can click through to GitHub, take a look at the changes that are in that PR. Uh, you can look over the code for spelling and syntax, uh, logic, uh, anything you know that you can think of while you're looking over it. Just leave a comment. Let us know what you found, what you're thinking. Um, if you did have hardware and you were able to test it out, let us know that in your comment on GitHub as well. Uh, if you do that a couple of times and would like to get leveled up to leave official reviews on GitHub, we can do that. Uh, we can work with you on um, doing that. And if you uh, would like to actually get your hands dirty with some coding, uh, one of the other things you can look at on circuitpython.org slash contributing is the list of open issues. These ones represent issues that are open on GitHub. Uh, they don't have any associated changes that have been submitted yet, so they are looking for a volunteer to come along and work on uh, whatever um, you know each issue is about, whether it's fixing a bug or adding a new feature uh, or what have you. Uh, so if you'd like, you can look through that list of issues and again, kind of find something that's interesting to you or that you've got the hardware for or that you feel like you've got the, uh, the knowledge of that particular library to be able to work on it. Uh, click through to GitHub, figure out you know, what the issue is actually talking about, uh, the specific bug fix or new feature, and submit your own PR 
uh, resolving that issue. We do have a learn guide that covers the process of contributing CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. We also have folks who are around throughout the week uh, who are willing to help you on Discord. So if you would like to contribute, whether that's reviewing uh, or submitting your own uh, PRs, but you feel like you have some barrier in the process, whether it's the version control uh, or the, uh, the actions or anything else, really, if you uh, feel like you'd like to commit uh, contribute, I should say, but you're having trouble with any part of the process, come say hi on Discord. Uh, we would love to help you out and get you uh, to a point where you are able to. We want everyone to be able to contribute in whatever way works uh, best for them. Uh, the updated libraries are listed here in the notes doc, so I'll let you take a look at those uh, in the doc if you'd like to see them. And that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for all those issues you've been squashing. Uh, now we're going to hear about Blinka. I believe that Melissa is not here today, so I will read. Uh, Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython on single board computers like Raspberry Pi. And uh, this week there was zero pull requests merged, uh, but there are nine open pull requests. Uh, one closed issue by one person and zero new issues. Currently 113 open issues and Pi Wheels downloads in the last month. Uh, 19,582, and number of supported boards, 146. And that is the state of CircuitPython, Libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Huggerports. Huggerports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So to kick things off, I'd like to say group hug. Uh, and then I will read for C. Grover, who is also a group hug. And now we'll hear from Dan. Okay. Um, thanks to Zarnlin, uh, who uh, has forked, fixed, and, and published as a new uh, extension, Joe DeVito's uh, VS Code sort of Python extension. So I put some links in the notes about that. Really appreciate that. Other people also have um, our reports for them, and th if this were this would be great because we can now kind of re-recommend using VS Code with sort of Python. Uh, thanks to Jeff for fixing up, finishing up Flopsy. That's mostly Arduino, but also there's a sort of Python part of that. And um, thanks to Scott for turning on getting USB to work on uh, ESP32 P4. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm looking forward to checking out that VS Code extension. Uh, now we'll hear from Foamy Guy, and then we'll hear from Jeff after him. All right, thank you. Um, I have a hug report for Jose David uh, for submitting a display IO sensor example. Uh, and also just uh, wanted to say it's nice to see your name pop up on GitHub. Hope you're doing well. Uh, echoing uh, what Dan mentioned, a hug report for Zarnalin for working on the VS Code extension. Um, I don't personally use VS Code too much, but I do uh, see lots of folks who want to use the extension uh, come through Discord. So I think it's really great to have somebody uh, working on it. So thanks to them for uh, for doing that. Uh, and then I have a group hug for everybody. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Jepler. Hello. So I want to thank Tim, Foamy Guy, for continuing to work on some of those long neglected issues across the libraries. Dan, thanks for uh, stepping in and testing some stuff on Windows and sharing your knowledge of USB. To me, it feels like you are kind of the master of the arcane knowledge there sometimes. Uh, Jose, uh, thank you for merging some pull requests that I filed a little while ago, and it's good to see you're spending a little time with us again. And thank you as well to Facts Engineering on GitHub for also merging in some pull requests that I created um, over the weekend. Those two sets of pull requests, um, well, I'll mention it down in uh, my status updates. That's it. Great, thank you. And now I'll read for Jose, and then we'll hear from Tan Newt. Uh, he has hug reports for GitHub user Brad Carr for making a PR to correct a bug in CircuitPython BMP581. They contacted me on my default library email that was on my spam. Anyway, that leads to my second hug report of Jepler for submitting various PRs in my libraries. Sorry it took me so long. And then we'll hear from Tan Newt, who is adding more pull uh, more hug reports as we speak. Uh, 
Thanks, Liz. Uh, first, I wanted to echo the hug to Zarnland for picking up the Visual Studio Code extension and improving it. And then the one I'm adding uh, at the end is uh, just a hug to Dan for picking up Circuit Matter while I was out uh, and continuing to work on it while I do other weird things. So thanks, Dan. Great. Thank you. And then I'll read for Toddbot, who is text only. Group hug, finally getting back to playing with CircuitPython, and y'all are so nice. Uh, Gambler21, Mark, for helping me with new board PR and for audio effects. And PR Cutler for doing all the hard work to make the Bootloader podcast happen. In case you missed it, they do have a new episode out this week, so definitely check it out. And that's going to wrap up Hug Reports. Next is Status Updates. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I will start. We'll go through the list alphabetically. Why call on you? Take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If the discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. And so I will get started. I took off last week for the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States. It was a nice, restful break, and now I'm back to pump out some work between now and Christmas, New Year's. Before my week-long nap, though, I published the Raspberry, the Feather RP2350 Audio Reactive Video Synth Guide. This project uses a Feather RP2350 with HSTX to DVI to run a video synthesizer that uses analog potentiometers and audio input with FST to control fun animations. I'm really proud of this project. It has been a goal of mine to work on video synth in CircuitPython, and I was thrilled to finally be able to do it and with the bonus points for audio reactivity. And now I'll read for C. Grover. Uh, continuing to work on refactoring Pi Portal and Matrix Portal weather displays that use AIO feeds to show weather kit and local sensor conditions, M4 memory limitations, and spy character timeout issues are the current challenges testing some acceptable workarounds. A playground note is in progress. And then we'll begin to investigate alternatives to the portal platforms that will likely involve ESP32 S3 feathers and 2.4 inch or 3.5 inch TFT feather wings. Portal boards will be repurposed for projects that won't need internet access, device testers, load cell scales, calculators, string car robots, etc. And now we'll hear from Dan. Okay, um, so I mostly took time off for Thanksgiving, but um, it just worked on some kind of random things last week, including sort of matter crypto support. And uh, then on like in the middle of the night on uh, like before Thursday, I got an idea about a way of specifying um, pin configurations uh, we often, when you construct things that use pins, so right now we often pass in extra arguments. Oh, I need this pull. I need this kind of setting or something like that. And a lot of times we have to add extra arguments to various constructors in the native modules when we pass in the pins. And I got an idea of passing in a pin configuration rather than just a pin. And I'll bring that up maybe in a little more detail in, in the weeds. And after I catch up on stuff for the past few days today, I'll go back to working on uh, crypto stuff for a certain matter. And that's it. Great. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Foamy Guy. All right. Thank you. Uh, I dug into an issue in, uh, in the core in Vector IO uh, where the rotations would make your Vector IO shapes. Uh, Get, get kind of positioned off by one. Um, the the default rotation was fine, but all of the other three rotations, your shapes would end up uh, one pixel too far uh, in one direction or the other, uh, or both in one orientation. Uh, so I dug around inside the, the vector IO code for a while and I turned on a bunch of the print statements inside there and fed it a bunch of different little one pixel shapes to try to figure out what did what and eventually figured out uh, the right place to fix it and submitted a solution so that uh, the different rotations will put the shapes in the same spot, which I was pretty excited about. Uh, I added a couple of the unknown boards to circuitpython.org. Uh, so there's new SparkFun, uh, Thing Plus 2350, and the other one was, I think, a WizNet uh, Ethernet 2350. And I'm sure we'll be 
seen a lot of new 2350 boards pop up uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, I in uh, in library land, I made a new uh, animation example that runs eight different animations in the NeoPixelate library. Uh, and then uh, on a couple other libraries, I've added type annotations for them. So these ones were uh, newer and didn't get done in the sweep that we did throughout the last uh, year or two uh, with annotations. So I've added uh, to two of them, and then I'm working on uh, a third one in the mini QR library as well that I'll get back to this afternoon after the meeting. That's what I have been up to. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Flummy Guy. Now we'll hear from Jepler. Hello again. Uh, so as an exercise, uh, I implemented a pure Python workaround for the uh, defect in the RP2350 called the E9 Erratum. There's a link on uh, GitHub to that code. It is slower than, and I'll share that in just a second in the channel, it is slower than the normal digital in-out because it has to modify the input enable register and is implemented in Python code, but in narrow circumstances it might be useful. I don't plan to library it or anything, uh, but it is out there. It was also, for me, a way to learn about this uh, module in CircuitPython called Memory Map that lets you directly access, uh, for instance, the pad registers on RP2350. Uh, also, for the RP2 family of microcontrollers, I added support for something called side set pinders in the PIO peripheral. We didn't previously expose this. It is useful uh, in that I found C examples for I squared C and one wire that used PIO and required this feature and it was requested by a community member. I assigned myself four uh, issues from the list of 9xx issues to work on this week, and I'm also looking at the newly released documentation and code for accessing the PIO peripheral on the Raspberry Pi 5. That code is in C, but we'd like to add it to Blinka if it's feasible. Uh, I will generate the 2025 public meeting calendar soon, um, as well as uh, part of the internal calendar, the first few months of the internal calendar that says who is hosting each week. And uh, the last thing is uh, there is some has been some movement on cleanup in community bundle libraries. There were some needed changes in pyproject.toml files. And I think all those have happened now. And so that will let me go back and remove a workaround in the bundle builder that's been there for about a year. Uh, yeah, and so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the calendar once we get down to in the weeds, but that's what I've got going on. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I'll read for Jose, and then we'll hear from Tanut. Uh, so Jose says uh, they're going to work on the Display I.O. Sensor Simple Test Examples. And now we'll hear from Scott. Hello. Um, I made a PR for USB support on the ESP32P4, which a bunch of, a bunch of boards don't build, so that's uh, my main coding task for today. Um, and then my brain got stuck. We, we were talking internally last week about this idea of moving. The, the question was, is how can we make it easier to port CircuitPython to more uh, chip families? And that kind of brought my brain to potentially moving CircuitPython on top of Zephyr. So Zephyr is this like pretty large um, RTOS hardware abstraction layer Bluetooth stack uh, project that's got a lot of momentum. Um, and I've always kind of fought it, um, but it really does give us a lot of things. And if, if, it, if we're OK circumventing it for the things that we need to do for CircuitPython, like dynamic pin muxing, um, it could be a really big boost for us to get uh, things going. So um, it would give us a common build system. So, so we'd use their build data. Um, we'd have default support for peripherals like I squared C, and then we'd also have a shared networking stack. Um, and that's all really tempting. So this week, my goal is to kind of just to see uh, what that entails and how much I can get going. And then um, I'm going to target the, the one of the motivations is the new NRF54 chips, um, which aren't using soft device anymore. So we for Nordic, the feature of Nordic stuff, we don't really have a good option, and Zephyr is is a good option. So um, if we do that, we can potentially move everything to Zephyr and, and share a lot of code, uh, which would be cool. So I'm going to try to do get that going kind of before I travel next Wednesday, um, and then I'll be headed to New York and then Michigan for the holidays. So um, that's where I'm at. Great. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing how the 
Zephyr stuff works out. Uh, and that wraps up status updates. Next is In the Weeds, and we actually have three In the Weeds topics this week. Very exciting. Uh, in the Weeds is an opportunity for long-form discussions that either come out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. But we have topics. Uh, first is uh, Jepler with December meetings and 2025 meetings. Hello. So I think this turns out to be more of an informational uh, in the weeds item than a decision. So the public calendar has no meetings on December 23rd or December 30th. So that will make um, our meeting on what will that be? The, uh, da, 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 the, the 16th be our last meeting of the year. And then I think we will meet January 6th as usual. Does that sound good to everybody to get back on January 6th after New Year's? I think that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, so in that case, I will uh, generate the 2025 calendar, the public calendar that's served from GitHub, as well as I will set up our internal hosting calendar for the first months of 2025. And uh, Scott, do you feel like hosting on January 6th? I should be able to, yes. But I don't okay. think I can make this December 16th. I don't think I'll make no, I, you're not on the list, are you? No, no, I don't think so. I'm just saying that I probably won't make yeah. that meeting either. But yeah, just yeah, wanting I, to, I, to figure out when you wanted to get back into it. So, I yeah, I will. Do, yeah, I'll be here. I, I'm, I'm back in town on the 31st of December, so. All right. That should be doable. I will get those things done, and yeah, that is all I needed to talk about. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you uh, handling those logistics. Uh, and now, uh, next topic is from Jose. It's text only, so I will read out his uh, blurb here. Uh, we're having this warning in the CircuitPython BMP581 uh, CI. This might be corrected by changing the version of pre-commit hooks uh, to version 5.0.0 in pre-commit config.yaml. According to my preliminary investigation, there are some libraries in the Adafruit repositories that have the change and some others not uh, to be confirmed. So seems like he's asking if he should change the pre-commit hook. Um. I can uh, I can jump in and offer, I think, a little bit of insight. I, I believe the version, or I believe the specific um, error that is kind of the root cause of this, just I glanced only briefly, so uh, I may have missed part of it, but in the link here uh, is like the package util thing, and we had this come up a lot when we first moved to Python 3.12 uh, inside of the action runners, and I believe the root cause is essentially pylint. So if you update pylint to, uh, I think anything in the 3.x branch uh, works. So there's 2. Dot something 2.17 or something like that is what's in pre-commit in a lot of the libraries. Um, if you update that to 3 anything, like 3.0.0 or, or any of the newer ones, then I believe it can run under Python 3.12 and it won't get that error um, and it should be able to at least pass that particular issue. All right. Um, looks like uh, changing this one. Um, Jose, do you want to maybe add in chat if... Uh, there's any follow-up you want to do or do you want to uh, go with uh, what foamy guy just suggested yeah looks like in this link uh jose if you just dropped it's got that updated so yeah it looks like looks like they found it okay yeah and some uh two i think it mentions in here yeah some libraries have it updated and some don't yeah so some of our some of the libraries have gotten updated to 3.x when people submitted PRs uh, and just they went ahead and updated the pylint uh, along with it so they could run it locally uh, others have been switched to rough, so they don't use pylint at all anymore. Instead, it's all under rough. And then uh, there are still quite a few that are on whatever version it was set to before, 2.0. Yeah. So um, it is a bit of a, a mix and match right now with the libraries. But 3.0 3 and above should work for pylint, and uh, rough should also work. Uh, if you use cookie cutter, you'll end up with rough. That's what the newest stuff has. Great. Thank you, Foamy Guy, for your knowledge on that. Um, now our third and final in the weeds topic is from Dan. So I'm not sure that 
we would discuss this in detail here, but there's a pointer to this PR I talked about, about passing a pin configuration. And the basic idea is that wherever you might pass a pin currently to say uh, some constructor, and I gave an example of PWM out here, uh, you could pass a pin dot configuration, which is a new class that's in underneath pin. Pin dot configuration doesn't do anything. It just holds settings. So it's not, it doesn't do a configuration. It's it's sort of marching orders for the pin uh, when it gets set up. And so an example here is like, and and there I there could be this helper function here, like you can pass it a pin and there'd be a helper function dot configuration, which would um, create a pin dot configuration object. And then on the common house side, you well, actually probably in shared bindings, you take the pin and if it's if it's just a pin, you would like create a default pin dot configuration. And so all the things that were passed into common how would be pin dot configurations. And then on the common how side, uh, there'd be some like validation of whether the setting was reasonable. And then there could be a common routine that sets up the pin in advance in most cases that does that does the drive strength or drive mode or pull changes. So that's the idea. Um, you can read that's a, the long discussion in the issue about this. And one reason that I did it this way, as opposed to just setting the kind of the raw pin, which might also be possible, is that there might be some ports where you can't set the pin um, state in advance before you start using it, or even after you start using it for some particular case. And that may or may not be true, but I, there may be some ports. So read, maybe read that in detail and see if you're interested and see if it makes sense uh, to you. And also maybe also read, I think it's the issue 1270, which had a long discussion of this, starting with something specific and getting more and more general about different ways to do it. So that's, that's just the, kind of my intro to this. Okay, that's it. Very cool. Do you um, want me to talk about it? Go ahead, talk about it. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of a pin configuration object. I don't think I'd construct it like you have here, mm -hmm. where it's like a, it looks like a function on the pin object right now. I'd probably just, like, instead of doing board.d5 configuration, I'd just do pin configuration in the first, first argument is board.d5. Yeah, I, I have that too. Yeah. Okay. Either of those. This is this was yeah. just like a, a shortcut to that. So yeah. this is right. This is it's rare in Python to have a function that is a construction a constructor helper, which is what that is. Right. Yeah. You could like capitalize the C and then like you're getting a little closer to like Maybe looking that, like an yeah, object and not a function, but and also even the name configuration. Like originally I thought of the word details or config or something. And it's, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't use the word configure because it's not configuring the pin. It's just, right. it's, it's, it's a configuration. Yeah. Right. Which I like. It's, it's, you know, in C world, it's kind of like, just like, we're going to make a struct for these common settings, right? Like. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what you're doing is like factoring out all those things into, into a shared pin configuration. Right, and and I hope that it will not be too much extra code. I mean, we we have to make this fit on the smallest ports. So I think it's, yeah, maybe not. But <laughs> I wonder if I I wonder if, um, yeah, I I'll follow up on the issue too. But my brain just thought like maybe we want to have like subclasses of of pin configuration as well, where like you can expose per port information to that's a possibility also yeah yeah or, or could there just be some things that are not implemented like you could have you could add extra arguments in most of which and a lot of them would raise not implemented yeah that's true like it's yeah. yeah so yes yes so jeff you asked yeah so digital in out first parameter would be a pin or a pin configuration digital in out is a kind of a special case because 
you often want to change those things. Uh, like you want to flip the, the pole or change the direction and all this. It's not really clear whether the whether the direction would be a configuration either. Usually that doesn't make sense. So the only three things that seem most important are poles, drive strength, and drive mode. Um, because you might want to specify those for many different things. And uh, and and you know, if we had done this a long time ago, like if we had done this at the very beginning, maybe we wouldn't even be passing pins. We'd always be passing configurations, or we do it a different way. I don't know. All right. Great. Um, okay. Just as a end user of CircuitPython, uh, I've run into um, uh, situations where this would be helpful. So I'm excited to see if uh, it does end up working out. Great. Okay. Can you elaborate on that list? Um, I, I can't think of the specific, but when Dan okay. described it, I was like, I've had to do this before. I've wanted to do this before and haven't been able to, but I'll try to get the exact example and um, maybe pass into the issue. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Of course, yeah. Okay. All right, and I think that's going to wrap up the meeting. Uh, so this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, December 2nd, 2024. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.